Live from New Delhi, you're watching DD India Global. We'll get you top stories from India and the region. I am Tanvi Tanija. And for news from the rest of the world, I'm joined by my colleague in London, Oli Barrett. Oli, what do you have for us today? Hello, Tanvi. It's 12.30 p.m. here in London, 1.30 p.m. across Central Europe. Coming up in the next half an hour, we'll be live to Israel, a gradual smoking ban here in the UK, and 100 days to go in Paris. First, you've got the headlines. Qatari Prime Minister says talks on a Gaza ceasefire and a release of hostages are at a delicate phase. Israeli Foreign Minister Israel Katz meets his German and British counterparts in Jerusalem. Kremlin urges de-escalation between Iran and Israel, just as Iranian military says it is ready to confront any Israeli attack. And last day of campaigning for first phase of India's general elections, 102 parliamentary constituencies to go to polls on April 19th. Now, as tensions with Iran reach a tipping point, Israel's war cabinet is expected to meet again on Wednesday to decide on a response. The war cabinet has met multiple times since Iran launched more than 300 missiles and drones towards Israel on Saturday night. Meanwhile, Iran's President Ibrahim Raisi warned of a severe and heavy response to any Israeli attack violating Iranian territorial integrity and harming its national interests. If the Zionist regime makes the slightest move to violate our territory and harm the national interest of the Islamic Republic, they must understand that they will face a severe and heavy response. The plan of action for troop promise was a limited operation. It was not a comprehensive and extensive plan. Had it been much larger action, then the supporters of Zionist regime would have seen that nothing would have remained of the Zionist regime. But it was decided to carry out a limited operation and deliver punishment to the Zionist regime. Qatar has said that talks on a ceasefire in Gaza and release of hostages are at a delicate phase. Qatari Prime Minister Mohammed bin Abdul Rahman Al Sani said that mediators were trying to address a stumbling block. Qatar, along with Egypt, is mediating talks to halt fighting between Israel and Hamas. <laughs> The negotiations are between moving forward and stumbling. During this time, we are passing through a delicate phase with some stumbling and we are trying as much as possible to resist this stumbling block and to move forward to put an end to the suffering that the Palestinian people are passing through in Gaza as well as to retrieve the hostages. Meanwhile, Russia is holding dialogues with both Iran and Israel and has urged the need for de-escalation in the Middle East. Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peshkov said that Moscow continues to have close contact with Iran and also has constructive contact with Israel. When asked if Tehran had warned Russia ahead of time about the strikes on Israel, Peshkov refused to comment on the matter. Now, just as Kremlin reiterates its stance of de-escalation in the conflict in West Asia, top European diplomats are also trying to achieve just that. My colleague Oli Barrett is in London. He takes it forward from me here and gives us more on this as well as other stories making headlines around the world. Oli, a lot happening in Jerusalem. Very much, Tanvi. A hive of diplomacy today. Top foreign ministry officials from the UK and Germany are in Jerusalem to meet Israeli Foreign Minister uh, Katz. This as world powers try, as you've been outlining, to prevent a wider conflict after Iran's Saturday attack. Katz met with British Foreign Secretary David Cameron and German Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock. Katz emphasized the importance of sustained international pressure to release all the hostages held by Hamas in Gaza. 
UK Foreign Secretary David Cameron highlighted a united front for Israel after Iran launched that barrage of drones and missiles on Israel last weekend. He says he's there to show solidarity. The situation is very concerning. It's right to show solidarity with Israel. Uh, it's right to have made our views clear about what should happen next, but it's clear the Israelis are making a decision to act. We hope they do so in a way that does as little to escalate this uh, as possible and in a way that, as I said yesterday, is, is smart as well as tough. But the real need is to refocus back on Hamas, back on the hostages, back on getting the aid in, back on, back on getting a pause in the conflict in Gaza. It's right to be in, here in Israel today to show solidarity after that appalling attack by Iran. Well, Didi India's Sarah Coates is live in Tel Aviv for us now. Sarah, Western diplomats do seem resigned to the fact that there will be a response from Israel against Iran. Any clues as to what it might be? Hello there, Oli. It's really a matter of when, not if, Israel retaliates. Sources close to the Security Cabinet, also the War Cabinet, uh, they say that they, the Israelis will be delivering a powerful, a strategic blow to Iran. And really the only thing that they haven't decided upon yet is when this should happen. Now, there really is broad consensus here in Israel that there must be a significant response given uh, this unprecedented attack that saw some 300 missiles and drones launched into Israel. But what we do need to remember here, Oli, is that uh, the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, he is under significant pressure really uh, to make sure uh, any kind of response doesn't cause a wider regional spillover. But he's also under a lot of pressure here domestically, especially uh, from people who keep him in power, like uh, the far right wing coalition, which do sit on his security cabinet. We're talking here Betzalel Smotrich and also Itamar Ben-Gavir. They are calling on the Israeli Prime Minister, on the Israeli security establishment to hit Iran with everything it has. So certainly an extremely delicate, worrying situation. OK, Sarah Coates in Tel Aviv. Thank you. British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak's plan to ban people aged 15 and under from buying cigarettes has passed its first parliamentary vote. The UK House of Commons approved a bill that will ban tobacco sales for anyone born in 2009 or later. The bill passed a vote with 383 in favour and 67 against, meaning it will progress to the next stage in Britain's Parliament, where it can be subject to amendments. However, dozens of Rishi Sunak's own Conservative MPs abstained or voted against it. WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange's extradition is one step closer as the United States provided a UK court with a series of assurances. Last month, the High Court in London ruled that without certain US guarantees, Julian Assange would be allowed to launch a new appeal against being extradited to face 18 charges in the United States for leaking diplomatic cables. Among the assurances submitted, one states that a sentence of death will neither be sought nor imposed on Julian Assange. After two days of jury selection, the first seven jurors have been selected to serve on Donald Trump's hush money criminal trial. The judge also warned lawyers that he would not tolerate any efforts to intimidate prospective jurors after saying that Donald Trump was audibly muttering while one of the possible members of the panel was being questioned. Donald Trump spoke out against the judge overseeing his New York criminal trial, repeatedly calling him conflicted and saying he shouldn't be there. I heard 78% think it's a rigged deal, and it is a rigged deal. It's a rigged trial. Our courts, everything is screwed up in New York, and the whole world is watching. This judge is so conflicted. You understand that. You'll take a look at that. There's never been a judge so conflicted as this. It's ridiculous. And also, there's no crime. 
It's exactly a hundred days until the 2024 Olympics get underway in France. Excitement is growing, but so is discontent among some Parisians. The athletes' village is ready and venues are having final touches applied. The build-up hasn't been without controversy, though, as Didi India's Ross Cullen reports from Paris. This year's Olympic and Paralympic Games are now just 100 days away and the final preparations are in full swing. It's the third time the French capital is hosting the Games and it comes 100 years after it was last in Paris in 1924. But the build-up has not been plain sailing. Tourist boats and cargo ships will be forced to alter their schedules due to the planned opening ceremony and some swimming events in and on the River Seine. This has never been done. It's never been tried before. So we're leaping into the unknown. We have to limit all the risks and there is a significant security element. And effectively, that will impact our activities. That's undeniable. For some Paris businesses, the Games could provide an economic boost. Some restaurants near the famous Champs-Élysées Boulevard are hiring more staff and extending their hours for the summer. For uh, restaurants, we will uh, be able to uh, to show our uh, to show our uh, culture, French culture, and to uh, give a good experience and the best experience uh, possible to our clients coming from all over all over the world. However, there has been criticism that event prices were beyond most budgets. In response. One million free tickets were handed out to young people, amateur athletes and people with disabilities. And Parisians are nervous about the security impact on daily life. QR codes will be needed to access certain areas near Olympic venues and there will be mass surveillance by the French authorities. The arenas are being readied and the final preparations are underway for Paris to host the biggest multidiscipline sporting gathering in the world. But as with any athletics event, there are always hurdles to overcome. Ross Cullen in Paris reporting for DD India. A hundred days to go then. Tanvi, back to you in the studio for the home straight. Thank you very much, Oli. Oli Barrett joining us all from London. More from Europe. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz has just returned from a trip to China that lasted all of three days. During his three-day trip, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz held talks with Chinese President Xi Jinping in Beijing on Tuesday. They deliberated on enhancing economic cooperation between the largest economies of Asia and Europe, with Scholz advocating for improved market access and fair competition for German companies. Scholz also urged Chinese President Xi to use his influence in helping resolve the conflict in Ukraine, emphasizing their joint stance against attacks on nuclear installations. So what did Scholz achieve? Let's try and understand this with DW correspondent Hans Brunt joining us now from Berlin. Hello, Hans. Uh, Germany has been worried about being too dependent on Chinese goods and the Chinese market, but it also wants to keep doing business there. So did Scholz find a new balance here? Yes, the key words here are de-risking and decoupling. Germany, as well as much of Europe and, in fact, the United States, feel that they are at risk in their own economies because uh, they are too dependent on certain goods being manufactured in China. And so they want to move the manufacture of these goods back to Europe or to the United States. But they do not, the Germans, do not want to cut ties with China. They do not want to decouple completely. In fact, Germany, uh, Germany's chancellor was accompanied by a high-level uh, group of uh, businessmen, business leaders from Germany who all want to continue investing and doing business in China and have been doing so at record levels for the past year or so. But they complain that there's an imbalance because China is flooding the global and the European market with uh, goods that, uh, are, uh, that are given support by the Chinese government, such as electric vehicles or solar panels. So they would like that to stop those kinds of goods not to be uh, pushed into uh, international markets. In fact, they got very little uh, in those terms uh, uh, from the Chinese. There was a lot of smiling, a lot of handshaking, but no concrete 
concrete concessions. They did sign one agreement uh, uh, about trade and that concerned German apples. Okay. Uh, China also has close ties to Russia and Germany has said that it hopes China can contribute to ending the war in Ukraine. Did Scholz get any assurances on that issue from his Chinese counterparts? No, I'm afraid here too he basically got very little or almost nothing. When he was last in China at the end of 2022, he and Xi Jinping issued a joint statement warning Russia against using nuclear arms in the conflict in Ukraine. Uh, and that was at the time seen as a, by Germany at least, as a success of German diplomacy. Uh, Scholz was trying this time round to get China to agree uh, to participate in peace talks regarding Ukraine. Such talks are planned in Switzerland in uh, just a couple of months' time, but uh, there was no assurance from China that it was prepared to participate there. China said it would only participate in peace talks that also included Russia, and so far Russia has refused to participate. So there was no rapprochement on that score. Certainly uh, China has said that it wants peace also there, but it's very much interested in maintaining its uh, connections to Russia. This includes, for instance, the export of certain goods to Russia that the West regards as dual use goods, goods that can be used both in civilian and in military uses. Uh, but again, there, there was no assurance from China that it would uh, restrict such exports to Russia. So once again, a lot of pomp and splendor, but no concrete results from this trip. Okay. One would hope that peace prevails in both these conflicts between Russia and Ukraine and Israel and Hamas. Thank you, Hans. Hans Braun joining us from DW Berlin. You're watching DD India Global, still to come on this show. United Arab Emirates hit by the heaviest rainfall ever surpasses all records. Dubai roads shut, airport submerged. And India celebrates Ram Navmi festival marking the birth of Lord Ram. Voice of a rising aspirational world. Stories of challenges, struggles and accomplishments. A world battling conflict, hunger and poverty. Embracing growth, development, science and technology. A voice of progress, a voice of unity. Watch Voice of the Global South with me, Akshay Dongre, only on DD India. Welcome back. You're watching DD India Global. I am Tanvi Taneja and next we bring you all the buzz related to the world's largest democratic elections now days away in India. So in India, star campaigners of various political parties are holding back-to-back -back rallies as campaigning will end today for the first phase of general elections that will be held on 19th of April. To garner support for the ruling Bharatiya Janata Party, senior BJP leader and Prime Minister Narendra Modi addressed a rally in the capital city of Agartala in Tripura. Earlier in the day, Prime Minister Modi held a public rally in Assam's Nalbari. Addressing the rally, Prime Minister Modi said that NDA has decided to reach out to every citizen of the country and provide them with the facilities they deserve. BJP is the party that is the one 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 that is कोई भेदभाव नहीं होता उनका लाभ हर किसी को मिलता है अब एनडीए ने ठाना है कि देश के हर नागरिक तक पहुंचकर जिस सुविधा का वो पात्र है वो सुविधा उसे दी जाएगी आप मुझे बताइए एनडीए सरकार की योजनाओं में आपको कहीं पर भी 
भेदभाव का सामना करना पड़ा है भेदभाव का सामना करना पड़ा है भेदभाव का सामना करना पड़ा है Down in the south, senior BJP leader and India's Defence Minister Rajnath Singh is in Kerala, where he addressed a public rally in Vadakkara earlier in the day. He held a rally in Kasaragod. He is scheduled to hold another rally in Kannur later in the evening. Senior BJP leader and Union Minister Nitin Gadkari will virtually address people in Nagpur, where he is up against Congress's India Alliance candidate Vikas Thakre. And opposition parties are also leaving no stone unturned to woo the voters ahead of elections. Congress leader Rahul Gandhi held a public meeting in Mandya city of southern state of Karnataka. Earlier in the day, Rahul Gandhi and Samajwadi party chief Akhilesh Yadav held a joint press conference in Uttar Pradesh's Ghaziabad. Addressing the press conference, Rahul Gandhi made a clarification on his promise of removing poverty in single stroke. Later in the day, Rahul will be holding a rally in Kolar city of southern state of Karnataka. Look, no one is saying that the poor will be removed in a small way. We are saying that the poor will be removed in a small way. और तरीके मैंने आपको बताए हैं नरेंद्र मोदी जी ने पूरा का पूरा फोकस 22 लोगों पे किया है 22-25 लोगों पे किया है आज की सच्चाई है कि 22 लोगों के पास उतना धन है जितना 70 करोड़ लोगों के पास है तो हम क्रांतिकारी काम करने जा रहे हैं On the other hand, Congress General Secretary held a road show in Saharanpur city of North Indian state of Uttar Pradesh, the lone seat from UP from where Congress is in the fray in the first phase. Congress Supremo Malikarjun Khadge will be holding public meetings in Nagaland and Karnataka today. He will address a gathering. In Nagaland's Dimapur and another meeting in Karnataka's Kolar. West Bengal Chief Minister Mamta Banerjee led Trinamool Congress on Wednesday release their manifesto for the upcoming Lok Sabha polls 2024. The party in its manifesto promised to repeal the Citizenship Act and stop the National Register of Citizens. After winning two seats in the Rajasthan Assembly poll last year, Bahujan Samaj Party BSP Supremo is all in to make way for more votes. Mayavati will be holding public meetings in Rajasthan's Alwar today. India is a vast nation with varying terrain and weather. Voting can be a challenge for multiple reasons and some people are just not interested. But Sikkim's 22-year-old first-time voter, Bikash Bhattarai, is not among them. He was born without both his arms, but he's encouraging everyone to vote by working with the state election office as a differently abled icon. Here's what he told Didi India's Gotham Roy. Thousand first time voters in the state, and one of them is with us. He's the state's icon for people with disabilities, male as well, and is working with the election commission to promote voting among the youth, especially, and everyone. Uh, Bikram, thank you for speaking to DD India. What can you tell us about your work with the election commission in the first place? How are you working to promote voting, especially among the youth, but everyone in general? Thank you so much, sir, for inviting me. Uh, firstly, I'm working with the Election Commission of India through different social media platforms such as Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. I'm promoting uh, by providing my video to them that uh, what are the different aspects uh, that has been provided by the Election Commission of India through which the young voters can uh, apply for the vote. And the special thing is about that young voters are the ones who are the pillars of the society, and I truly believe that they will cast their first time vote. And make a very good government. Sir. And you're uh, yourself among those pillars, 22 years old. So how excited are you about your first vote in uh, India's parliamentary and the state assembly elections? So I'm really excited about it. And in fact, uh, I was given an option that home voting can be done from as being a PWD. But I chose to 
uh, go and vote in the polling station and because if I'm going to the polling station to vote then I truly believe that the young voters should also come and vote sir. Bikram and people like him have been giving out uh, ever since uh, the election process got underway that people should come out in maximum numbers. That's what is being expected in Sikkim as well when it comes polling day on the 19th of April. With camera person Sumit Haman, this is Gautam Roy in Gangtok for DD India. And more from Asia now. Dubai International Airport has been experiencing significant disruptions due to bad weather. Airport has been advised, uh, advising passengers to avoid traveling to the airport unless absolutely necessary. They are working to restore normal operations soon. Flights have been delayed or diverted while some crews have been displaced. The airport officials stated that it would take some time to get operations back to normal. And now we take a look at other stories making news around the world. British actor Hugh Grant has reached a settlement in his lawsuit against the publisher of the Sun tabloid newspaper. His lawyer disclosed in court documents on Wednesday that Grant alleged journalists had employed private investigators to tap his phone and blurgerize his residence. Myanmar's detained ex-leader Aung San Suu Kyi has been moved from prison to house arrest. The military government said that the decision was taken as a health measure due to a heat wave in the country. According to junta spokesperson Suu Kyi, 78, and Win Mint, the 72-year-old former president of her ousted government, were among the elderly and infirm prisoners moved from out of the prison because of severe heat. And back to India now, where the festival of Ram Navmi is being celebrated on Wednesday. The newly built Ram Temple in Uttar Pradesh's Ayodhya is all decked up for Ram Navmi celebrations. This year, the auspicious occasion was made more special by the Surya Tilak ceremony of Ram Lala when the sun rays fell on the forehead of the deity's idol sharp at noon. Devotees thronged in large numbers to get a glimpse of the deity. Prime Minister Narendra Modi also shared the visuals of watching Ram Lala's Surya Tilak ceremony virtually and mentioned that this is a very emotional moment for him. And that's all in this edition of DD India Global. Join us for another edition of the show live from Washington DC at 7.30 p.m. IST. For those on the go, you can get all the latest news and updates from India and across the world on the DD India mobile app. The app is available on both Android and iOS platforms. Scan the QR code on the screen to download now. We'll be back with more news as it breaks here on DD India. I'm Tanvita Neja from all of us here in New Delhi. Thank you for watching. Namaskar.